Maine Frontiers. And as you can see on our screen today, we do have Roger Bylas. He actually will be the host at the TWI Summit. So make sure you do check out the TWI Summit on the Lean Frontiers website. Let me take a quick minute to introduce Roger. Roger Bylas is the president and founder of the Bylas Group, LLC, a performance improvement and organizational transformation consulting group. Roger is a certified instructor in all the TWIJ programs, job instruction, job relations, job methods, improvement, and job safety. Roger, take yes. over. All right. So let me share my screen here. Okay. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay, can everyone see that? Not yet. Not yet? Looks like it's shared. I did not share it. I don't know. No, can't see it. Oh, okay, here we go. Oh, perfect. See it. Let me get it into the full screen. Okay. So are we good? Good. All right. Can you hear that? We can hear it a little bit. And we are in presenter view instead of presentation mode. All right. So let me stop that. The reason <laughs> I played that is um, Mark Warren and I, he's a friend of mine and a colleague as well. He and I were working on how do we make TWI useful? And uh, he started out with 12 steps. We got it down to nine. We then got it down to um, eight and at the end of our working together we finally wound up with three steps and i said hey i gotta play leonard skinner give me three steps but as you heard it said give me three steps and let me walk out the door you'll never see me anymore and he goes well that's not good for consulting because every consultant wants to stay with a client and i thought to myself no it is i'm gonna make these three steps so easy you're not gonna need me afterward after this webinar, you're not going to need me. You're going to be able to look at this and go experiment, try to do things, try to get um, the process that you want uh, improved. And I don't think you're going to need that person there that's going to have to be in your facility all those times. So let's just get right down to business. Let's talk about the three steps. Hey, Roger, real quick. We see it's in uh, presenter view, not presentation mode. Okay, so let me see. Share. Hmm. Hang on. The technology today. Is it it now, right? Perfection. Yes. Okay. Okay, everyone. We actually did do this ten minutes beforehand. I don't know how I screwed it up, but. I'll go through some more training on that. Okay, so the three steps are very simple. Structure, stabilize, simplify. They're verbs. First, you have to structure your operation, then you wanna stabilize it, and then you're gonna simplify it. You can also use them as nouns. Structure is a noun. You gotta develop your structure. You gotta create stability and then shoot for simplicity. So having said that, that's what we call a heuristic. If you look at the big, uh, uh, the knowledge funnel here, the big mystery or the problem, how do I continuously improve? How do I get improvement over time? If that's our mystery in this funnel, you'll create what they call heuristics. Heuristics are just an approach to solving a problem. Now, it's not necessarily the best approach. There could be better, there could be easier, but it is sufficient for reaching that immediate short-term goal. So that's basically what we have there is the heuristic. Now, the thing with heuristics is they require you to be experienced in their application. They're very applicable in many different situations, but people with years of experience find it very easy. People that are brand new to a heuristic may not. They may not understand how to apply it. So what we create are what we call algorithms. And you can see that at the bottom of the funnel. An algorithm is that step-by-step -step procedure for solving the problem or accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. 
we have these algorithms. If you think about lean, the, al uh, the heuristic is we want to generate flow. The algorithms are the lean tools, the seven wastes, 5S, things of that nature. And so you can see that algorithm and use those algorithms. You may be brand new to lean, but you can make some headway. Now, the problem with algorithms are they're very specific. I mean, if anyone's done any kind of lean implementation, a lot of times consultants come in, they say, the first thing we need to do is 5S. Let's get that 5S going. But is that what's really necessary? I mean, I was in a continuous operation. We were doing 5S, but our machines are running at around 50% uptime. It didn't really matter what 5S was done or was not done because there was so much going wrong with the machines, we weren't seeing any improvement. Now, if you look at autonomous maintenance, it has a 5S component in it for the machines. We could have used it, and then we did as we switched over, used it to improve our biggest problem, the machines aren't running enough, and at the same time achieve 5S around those machines, each individual one. And the impact was so much greater. So knowing what tool to apply and how to apply it in all the different situations, again, is kind of tricky. So if you look at what we have here, heuristics, structure, stabilize, simplify. Now I say to somebody like Mark Warren, who has 40 years, 50 years experience, they say, Mark, so when you, you, you want a structure, what does that mean? He goes, well, you just go out to the shop floor, you walk through the line and you kind of connect the dots. Now, if you tell that to somebody that's been out there on the shop floor for 20 years, just walk through and it should all be apparent to them, they're not going to believe you because they haven't got that experience in the way he does. So what he and I did is said, okay, look, if it's structure, let's create some step-by-step -step procedures that can help people find that structure and improve the structure of their operation. Let's find those step-by-step -step procedures for stabilize. How do we stabilize? What are the tricks? Some of them, not all of them, but some of them that you could use today even after this webinar. And it's the same thing with Simplify. So let's move on to that first one, structure. Structure, it's connecting the dots. You have all these activities out there, these work centers, these jobs that are being done, and they're connected with like nodes and links. So what you wanna do is go where the work is being done. In this case, the work is being done um, out on the shop floor in the service area, wherever it is, go to that place and start from the beginning. You know, I know in value stream mapping, they say start from the end. If you want to, you can, but I like to start in the beginning. Where does it all come in? And watch it go through. Now there's some useful tools. One of them, paper and pencil. All you really need is a sheet of paper and a pencil and start writing down. You put little boxes on a piece of paper, write them down. What's the first thing you do? What's the second operation? What's the third operation? And you could capture it on that. Now. A tool I think that could be a little bit better is a flip chart with post-it notes. The reason I say that is now you're sharing what you're copying down, what you're capturing about the structure. You're sharing it with the people that are giving it to you. I learned a hard lesson one time. I, I carried a, a clipboard around in a fold up clipboard case. And I always took notes because I knew that I think so much was going on that I was going to forget by the time I got back to my office. So I take notes on what the people said and then go back to the office. And after six months of, of doing this, one of the guys says to me, he goes, what are you writing on that clipboard? And I said, just things I have to do. He goes, let me see. And he actually looked at it and he goes, oh, you really are. And I said, right, what did you think I was writing? He goes, I thought you were writing things about what we were doing wrong so you could come back and get us. And I looked at him shocked, but then it dawned on me. I never showed him what I wrote. I never shared with him what I wrote. If you have a flip chart and post-it notes, they're seeing it. They can help you correct it. They can help you make it better. They can capture the real structure. Because if you're not doing the job out there, you may not know all the things that are truly being done. A rolling whiteboard is even better. You capture the whole thing on a whiteboard and dry erase marker. Next thing you know, you're creating with them the structure. You can show them the plan to move forward with stability and simplicity right there. And as the things get improved, they'll see the board change right in front of them. So those are useful tools. But again, what you want to do is start recording these activities, capturing the sequence of the work. You're also going to want to start to, to group them. Like, well, these seem to go together a little bit. And whether that's actually on the paper or the whiteboard or the flip chart, or maybe it's mentally. You know, I think of the Russell Crowe movie, A Brilliant Mind or Beautiful Mind, where he looks at all his post-it notes on the, on the wall, and some of them sort of glow a little bit brighter. And he puts together the answer like that. Well, that's what you want to do mentally. Man, I'm looking at this. I'm looking 
looking at this, you stand back and all of a sudden you may see it. Look, the worms were closer. It's not going to be an exact science yet. The other thing is when you're connecting these dots, when you're capturing those nodes and, and those links, look for the disruptions. Where's the scrap? Where's the rework? Where's the frustration in the people? Where are most of the questions coming from? Look for inventory. Inventory is a great uh, display of things that aren't flowing well. Where do I have distance? Where's the line imbalance? Is there a, a line demand imbalance? Look for these things as you're doing and capturing that structure because you're gonna be able to come back and use them when you go to stabilize. Now, one of the things is what level do you go to? I recommend starting at the high level. And this was an operation where I assembled a part, I cut it, I glued it, and then I welded it. And that was the complete making of the part. I started at that high level because if you go to the in-depth detailed level on every part, you may spend days trying to find out, get it right, make sure you've got the correct things in there. But at this level, I went through and I said, that's pretty good. And then, so when I went to stability, I realized I had a problem. I had a problem in the cut operation. And that's where I dove deep. And I dove into that setting, you know, taping, marking the cut, setting up the bandsaw, making the cut, cleaning the parts. And of those five operations, making the cut was the worst. And that's when I used the breakdown again. JI is an excellent way at the high level, you could go through and say, what are we doing here? What's our first step? Well, we assemble it, then we cut it, then we glue it, and then we weld it. And then when I went to do the deep dive, I did the same thing in cutting. Well, first I have to take the part because I'm going to make a line on it. And then I mark it with a speed square and a Sharpie. And then I set the bandsaw up so that the table cuts the, the angle between zero and three degrees either way. I need to set that up and then making the cut. I make that cut and then I clean the parts. JI can help you get that level of granularity. So when you're doing your structure, always remember that tool is in your toolbox. Use it in the sense that it's going to help you see the structure. You can come back when you get down to the finest level of granularity and use it to train people but it also helps you sort that sequence out as you go through. Now, we've got our structure, we've captured it on there, got kind of an idea where things are working. Now you want to remove the obstacles. What do we look for? Just what we said, quality, scrap, rework, inventory, flow stoppage, uneven loading, hard jobs. Look for these things. And the best way to look for them, one is of course out on the floor, but two, talking to the people doing the work. They're going to give you insights that you can never see just making a breakdown. In that job that I showed before, I made a breakdown of that cut operation. It was about 15 steps. I don't know. No, about eight or nine steps, about 15 key points. And after I did, I said, oh, this is probably pretty easy. I jumped on there. The first three parts we scrapped. And the guy that uh, was helping, he was 6'4". He was much bigger than me. He put his hand on my shoulder and he goes, that's okay. You just may be never able to do the job. Here I am, I've got the best breakdown. I understand everything and I still can't do it. It was tough. It was something that was difficult. So I would have never known that making the breakdown. But when you ask the people, they can tell you, ask them what bugs them. Find out from them where their problems are. And then if you really want to include them, if you really want to show that this is something that's going to impact their lives, ask them at the end of finding the obstacles, What's the one thing we could do right now to make your job easier? 50% of the time, people tell me, just give me a garbage can and throw this stuff in. You know, I got to walk all the way over there. We made it easy to empty the garbage cans, but hard to put stuff into them. Find that one thing. You're not going to buy a $20,000 machine. You're not going to hang up a, a, a board for all their tools that first day, but you could maybe just get them a wrench. That was one of the biggest things in one operation. Guy had to go up and down. He goes, if I could just have a wrench up on top, on the, on the deck up there, it would save me probably 15 times up and down the 20 stairs. How do you think he felt when that wrench showed up at the end of the day? So use the folks there. They're going to be the ones that tell you. And so you may not get the biggest obstacle. You're going to get their obstacle. And if they find the next one and the next one, you're going to get to the biggest obstacle pretty quickly. Now, what kind of obstacles, what kind of problems you have? Well, there's two types that I look for. One are process problems. Process ones, you know, that's something like, I don't have the wrench. 
give the guy the wrench. He's got the wrench. He can tighten up. He can loosen. He can make the adjustments. He can do whatever he needs to do. Those are simple. Oftentimes, the operator can do it, maybe with assist from the supervisor. Then you have systems problems. If we go back to that cut, they wanted me to cut a round piece on the bottom with a flat top. They wanted me to hold it and cut it through a bandsaw. There were 14 to 16 bars that I had to go through and break through every time, keeping it level. It's not going to work. When I looked at all the issues around that cut, it dawned on me, this isn't a process problem. This is a systems problem. And I looked and I said, gosh, we're cutting it on this bandsaw. If we flip it over, put it on the table saw, we could run it right through. I mentioned that to the guys already doing it. And they said, well, we tried that, but we could never get it right because it's not a square piece. So process problems, I think operators are good to go. A supervisor may be able to support and, and supply resources. System problems, you're going to need that maintenance person, maybe an engineer. Maybe senior leadership is going to have to look at this problem and say, do we do something in a larger sense to take care of it? Moving it over to that table saw, a systems change eliminated, if we go back, it eliminated the entire operation of weld. There was no more welding. We cut it so perfectly, we were using the weld not only to hold it together, but also fill in where we had bad cuts. The welding was no longer required. So a systems improvement, if you can make one of those, oftentimes takes out three or four process problems. How would your team members like that if they could get two, three, four problems done at once? So think of the types of problems that you have, process or system, and then make sure the right people are working on the right ones. If an operator is trying to solve a systems problem, he may not have the resources, not the ability, may not have the upstream and downstream knowledge to be able to take care of it. Get somebody to help with those. So stabilizing is a, is a continuous process, but it's easier if you know what you're trying to do in stabilizing it. So in this case, this is called the Cunifin framework with, uh, created by a guy named Dave Stoughton. He says that it's a sense-making tool for decision-making, trying to get sense about it. I'm going to say that it's just a problem-solving tool. And in this problem-solving, he's got five areas that you could be in to solve problems. Now, the first one we're going to start with is simple down here. You see simple? This is where we already know what the standard work is. We know what the best practices are. We know the known solution. It's all there. It's perfectly set up for training somebody and then having them execute. If you go to complicated, though, you know what the variables are, but you don't know what their impact is. The variable could be, could be heat and it could be pressure. But you've got a new material in there, so you don't exactly know what heat and what pressure should be set for. You're going to have to run experiments. If you're thinking of kata, isn't that perfect? You run an experiment, change the pressure, change the heat. I'm not a kata expert, but I do know that kata is about doing those kinds of experiments. It would be a perfect application. And then if you don't know even what the variables are, you're in complex. The variables aren't known yet. I was working with a company that was creating a new line to make a product. And I said, they said, well, we're just gonna you know, break down all the jobs, and do all this work and, and get it. And I said, so are you bringing in new equipment? And they go, oh yeah, it's about 70% new equipment. I said, you've never used it? And they go, no. And I said, do you think you know what the variables are on it? And the operations manager said, we're in complex. We have no idea. We are going to have to experiment in complex. We're going to have to figure out what those variables are so we can get to complicated and then down to simple before we even want to start standardizing. Yeah, sure, we want people to be doing it as much the same way, but to get to that final standard work and then drive the, uh, the JI training in through the training matrix to get it all done, we may need a little bit more work in complex then. Maybe on a startup, if we start thinking that way, what are the variables that we're gonna have to experiment with in complicated to get us to simple? And then in chaos, we may not know what it is at all. You're just trying to get out of this dangerous situation, whether it's physically dangerous or you know, economically dangerous because you're making a lot of scrap or whatever. You'll attempt things to move you into one of the other uh, quadrants. And in the center's disorder, that's when you walk up, you're not sure probably or possibly which quadrant you're in. So you'll have to figure that out. Now, how does TWI help with this? Well, if you're in simple, you can see down there, JI is a great way of training. If you have the standard work, if you have the best practice, if you have the known solution, 
job instruction training. Just teach everyone and then make sure they use it. JR would be a good way to make sure they use it. If they're not, maybe there's something that isn't yet. You got to go back to complicated, figure it out, and then re-standardize the work. JR is a great way also of troubleshooting. If the process breaks down and you think you're in simple, let's gather the facts, weigh the side, take action, check results. Boy, that sounds like a complicated, it sounds like an experiment that you'd run in complicated. And you could easily use that using JR in there. In complicated, JR is a great problem solving tool as well. In that problem solving, you know, I just went through it. You're going to take those variables and make experiments around them. I think in Kata, you're supposed to only use one variable. It's perfect for that too. You can make those experiments, but rapidly. So now you know the variables, you make your hypotheses, you test them, you learn from them, and now you're onto your next experiment. Maybe you stabilize that variable, maybe it's onto the next variable, or maybe there's more experimentation. Now, complex is a tricky area. We talked a little bit about it. You may not know the variables, and this is where JI is a great sorting process. If you use JI to lay out your structure, you're going to have some key points. You would say to them, is there anything in here that makes or breaks this function? At a high level, they're going to go, yeah. You know what? When it's when it gets humid out, we have a problem with the operation. Why? Well, the molds are sweating. True example. So every time in the spring when the humidity started rising from the winter, they had a sweating mold problem. What is the variable? Well, we know humidity is going up, but why is it going up inside this bottle machine? Once it got hot, they put a fan on themselves. The fan blew on the operator across the operator and into the machine where the mold sweat. So once we understood the variable of humidity, how did it get in there? We started doing the experiments when we turned the fan and mounted it to blow a different direction, but not into the machine, we could solve the problem. And so that's how you take a complex project and you start. What are the things that could be impacting it? Do your experimentation down in, in complicated. JM is also a great tool by challenging. You've got your your six challenges. Why is it necessary? What is its purpose? You've also got, is this the best time, the best place, or the best person to do it? And then is this the best way? You take those challenges, that will also help you start to see the variables. Using this sense-making tool then can get you to a quicker solution. If you're trying to solve a complex problem using simple tools, it won't work. Or it may work, but it'll take a lot longer time. If you just go to try to find the variables that you're going to experiment with and then roll down into simple, you can make this flow a lot quicker. And as you get down to simple, you can have your people doing it. Okay, the last thing is you want to close the gaps, and that's simplify. Simplify the task, closing the gaps in space, time, loading, best practices. In space, how do I get it closer? Can I put these two together? Can I just hand off? Does it really need to go into a cart? Timing wise, this takes very little time, this takes forever. Should they be done together? Should I build inventory? I don't know. Let's simplify that, the loading of it. You know, if I have a very hard task and a very easy task, the guy that does the easy task is gonna be looked at by the guy that does the hard task and, and he's not doing anything. And then best practices. Best practices, not only in your area, but adjacent spheres. If I'm working in plastic, where do you think I went? Do I go into plastics and try to find out how to make what nobody else is making already? No, I went into woodwork. All I had to do was change a blade. Now, here's a key thing to simplify. Eliminate the key points. There's where you can go. Like I said, in that one operation, we had, you know, I don't know, 15 steps and 20, 30 key points. By the time, six to eight months after we started improving on that, I just tried to get rid of key points. If there was a need to hold it a specific way, why? If I had to hold the, the, the part down so it wouldn't ride over the blade, why? Well, the blade causes it to rise. Could I clamp it? I clamped it. No key point. All you had to do was, as a step, clamp the part. You clamp the part, all the key points go away for the blade rising and pushing it. You have to pull it back and not cutting your fingers. So look at those key points. Those are your opportunities for simplifying. You know, the, 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 the obstacles will come out pretty easy, but the simplifying is the key points. I love those because, you know, we were training up two guys to do this, this job. And uh, I said to the guy, so after a whole day of doing it, I said, how do you like it? He goes, well, it's really easy. I go, well, you know, you work pretty hard. What, what do you mean easy? He goes, you know, I just walked up, I turned the machine on and did it. There was no tricks about it. It was nothing. We just pushed the part through. He goes, yeah, it was the easiest job I've ever done. Because most of the time, you know, you got to do all this other stuff besides the job. Those are the key points. 
we eliminated the key points in one day, brand new people, first day. I got two guys and myself. We started, we used to do with three people, six parts in two days. In one day, we did 54 parts, two brand new guys. We did the job. So simplifying is critical. Now, it's an iterative process. You've got your structure. You start there. That's your baseline. And then you go to stabilize. As you're going through stabilize, you may hit simplify. But maybe it's a really easy process. You go from structure right to simplify. That's the upper arrow. Maybe when you hit simplify, you go back to stabilize. Maybe when you hit stabilize, when you think about what we did, we changed that whole process from the, the bandsaw to the table saw. We skipped a whole operation. We went back to structure. How do we restructure this now? We took out welding. We didn't need that whole area anymore. It's an iterative process and it's iterative learning. Iterations are in learning. If you think about lean product development, they have a concept, build, measure, learn. In build, measure, learn, lean product development, there's a book out there on it. You build the product, you see what the customer thinks, measure, and then what you learn from it. This is the same way as improvements. You have a, a hypothesis, you go out, you measure, you implement it, you measure, how did you do? Is it better? What did we learn? It's psychotic, like isn't it? Build, measure, learn, and new product development can be doing with continuous improvement. So the iterations then become continuous learning that leads to continuous improvement. And what are the next steps for something like this? You could go out today. I'm looking at 27 minutes into this. Pick an area of difficulty. Capture the structure. You don't have to have a whole line, just maybe one operation. Get the structure right there. Work with a team member to identify the obstacles after working with them to get the structure. Pick one thing you can do to immediately improve the work. At the end of the day, or maybe the next day, if you didn't get to implement it right away, ask them about the impact of the change. Tomorrow, repeat. So three steps. Give me three steps. If you take these three steps, after you take them, I'll have to walk out the door. Who has any questions? Is it time for questions? I'm going to stop the share. Okay. You guys can chat in your questions if you'd like. Um, we do have one asking if we will share the slides. Roger, will you send me the slides? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right, yes, right. Okay. We, we will share the slides. <laughs> so I can't, how do I see all the gallery? Anybody have any questions? We have one. Can you please repeat the difference between process and system? Okay, so in a process problem, it, it's more a level of, of impact. So like if a blade's dull on a saw, you're gonna get a bad cut. Now, if I come up and say, I got a bad cut here. Well, okay, I could see that. And, and that blade needs to be sharpened or changed. And once I do that, I've solved the problem. Now, if I'm using, and here's, here's the difference between sharpening a blade in a process problem and looking at that process as a system, I've now got wood tools with wood blades cutting plastic. True example, I looked at this, I said, you know, my hands are getting cut with the plastic and everything. I'm like, I've got to clean these parts. I measured the cut. It was 40 seconds to make two cuts. It took me between two and four minutes to clean the melted plastic off the, pro uh, off the product. So basically, six times longer to clean it than to cut it. Is that a process problem? No, I, I, you know, I didn't know that there were blades out there. Now, in my position, you know, I'm just an operator at this time, but it was also a very curious one. I got online and I found a blade that was made for plastic that was a no-melt blade. Now, it was $250 versus the $50 blade at Home Depot that was the best you could buy. $250, we really need it. It's a process change. No, this was a systems change. We changed our cutting blade all to plastic no melt blades and eliminated all cleaning. So instead of two to four minutes, I hit it with an air gun, four seconds, all the feathery 
uh, shavings are gone, it's a clean part ready for the next process. Process, I could have sharpened the blade. Systems, I changed the system. A lot of times you'll see these systems problems with the number of process problems around it. So we had a problem here, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. That whole operation's a problem. Is there something in the system we can change? Is the material good coming in? Is it to the right spec? Do we have the right spec? It could be the spec, but the wrong material, the wrong spec. You know, maybe we need to change that. These are things that an operator oftentimes won't be able to do. And that's where I think the difference is who can actually address? You know, an operator can move a machine closer to another one. I did. I was walking 12,000 steps when they um, had the other two guys there. When they let them go, it was just me. 12,000 steps, I'm not going to make it every day. I got it down to 4,000 steps. I went from six miles to four miles. That four miles was 80 minutes minimum, if not maybe 100, 120 minutes. So I added that in productivity. All I was trying to do is my, my main goal in life was to go home with more energy than I came with, that I went home with yesterday. And so every time I made it easier, I saved time, we made more. And so the process problems I did is I just moved stuff closer, one box at a time. Next thing you know, you know, one percent improvement a day is thirty-seven times improvement at the end of the year, and so that's what I shot for. So look at those process problems. Even just a wrench, you know, one guy when we want and got the one wrench for him, he goes, "He needs a wrench. Just a wrench. Is that it? How much is going to be saved?" Well, twelve times up and down the stairs, every every changeover, he had to go up and down, get a wrench, and then take it back to the other place, and half the time one there, a wrench is twelve bucks. It was huge savings. But more importantly, this was a guy. They said, you know. He's probably not going to talk to you. He's really quiet. You know, he's reserved. He knew what he needed. He talked. I don't know. I mean, I think you can get there, find out what those process problems they have. What are their obstacles? Their obstacles. And then when you start to see that it's a systems issue, it's bigger than just this person. We've got two or three operations there. Then you may want to look at it as a system. Does that help or not? I'm not sure. Thank you, Roger. Anybody else have a question? Okay. Well, um, just a reminder that you will receive a link to view this recording 24 to 48 hours. And don't forget that you can see Roger Bylas as your host at the TWI <laughs> Summit in March in Jekyll Island. <laughs> And thank you, everybody who participated in today's webinar. Thank you, Roger, for taking the time yeah. to speak with just, all of us. Just about hosting. I want them all to know that I've, I've been really researching this. I've been studying Ricky Gervais at some of his <laughs> hostings. And I think we're going to be able to pull a Ricky right there at Lean Frontiers TWI Summit. I, <laughs> I hope everyone gets excited with that. If you don't know who he is, maybe a quick Google uh, Foreign Correspondence Award, a couple of those you'll get an idea of how much fun you're going to have at the uh, summit. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't wait. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, you all, you understood the assignment. Okay, that's all I got. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. We will see you next time. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Bye-bye.